On March 11, 2011, the most powerful earthquake ever recorded in Japan struck the Tohoku region. It unleashed massive tsunami waves that swallowed coastlines, shattered roads, and even cut out the power, directly triggering the Fukushima nuclear disaster. But the world didn't just tremble from the headlines, it also trembled with oscillations, with the entire planet sending low-frequency waves across oceans and continents. If you were far from the coast, you wouldn't have noticed a thing, but those vibrations, they left a signature, one that scientists could measure. Think of them like organized patterns, even similar to square wave formations which we can see on Ile de Ré, an island off the coast of France. But what if we wanted to feel and see it everywhere? We would need to live on a very different Earth, the one where the polar ice caps have melted and oceans have risen by more than forecasted 70 meters, which is high enough to flood every continent, not unlike the Waterworld movie from 1995 starring Kevin Costner. Now, in a world like that, even a minor tectonic shift could send waves rippling across the entire planet. With no land to interrupt them, those waves would settle into smooth, stable rhythms shaped by the size and symmetry of the globe itself. And dating back to the 18th century, physicists began to describe these kinds of patterns. They call them spherical harmonics, elegant waveforms that show up everywhere, from sound and gravity to global lighting and computer graphics. Hey, my name is Marco and I'm trying to understand how Lumen works and in this part of our global illumination lecture series, we're continuing our exploration from the irradiance caching and environment light probes to explore what spherical harmonics are, how they help us store and evaluate irradiance efficiently and why they've become a backbone of real-time lighting techniques. And apart from cube maps, which are textures, spherical harmonics can be thought of as a sound wave wrapped around a sphere. And by the end of this video, you'll understand not just how spherical harmonics work, but why they are the reason we can fake global illumination without tracing millions of rays in real time, and still get soft, believable lighting in dynamic scenes. So, let's get to it. Now, before we start, a little backstory. I ran into the concept of spherical harmonics around three years ago, so back in 2022, while listening to Jérôme Plateau, the lead artist at Epic Games, and his lecture on lighting in Unreal Engine 4 at the time, which was all the way back in 2017. So a lot of things have happened since then. Anywho, at one point he mentioned the use of spherical harmonics, and you know how I like to think I'm a smart guy, but I could not grasp the concept nor the application approach for them, even in the slightest. The issue was, as was mentioned in a comment on the channel, the lack of proper resources for explaining what spherical harmonics are used for, apart from the explanations used in quantum chemistry. Since then, I explored several resources, one of which was spherical harmonic lighting, the gritty details by Robin Green, which offers a great overview on its own, as well as Peter Pike Sloan's take on it from stupid spherical harmonics. But I needed real hands-on experience and down-to-earth simple examples, so opted to research additional things, and following your requests, I have focused on the basics, but also wanted to go a bit deeper with technical details, which should be enough for generating understanding and application without the behind the scenes happenings. During my research, I was cooperating with Pavel Vorobyev, a developer on the HTrace asset for Unity, who was kind enough to offer his expertise and knowledge on various topics related to understanding Lumen, including spherical harmonics. And I felt I had enough knowledge and understanding to share this with the community members. So let's explore. How spherical harmonics work and why they were the go-to tool for dynamic global illumination with excellent performance gains when compared to cube maps. So let's go back to this example from before and remember that the indirect lighting is coherent and it does not change abruptly, but gradually. If we wanted to store this information, we would need to back it into a texture, which is not memory friendly. Similarly, if we consider a sine wave, it has a gradual change of its Y value and also has only a couple of coefficients necessary for its description, which is extremely memory friendly. And this leads us to a conclusion that if we can somehow incorporate trigonometric waves as a manner to store irradiance light, we can drastically reduce the amount of memory and improve performance. So can it be done? This is the exact question that was posed in the research paper from 2001 about an efficient representation for irradiance environment maps, and we can explore it in the following manner. So let's go back to the waves aspect and check out an interesting case. So if we have two waves of different frequencies, we can add them together into one by stacking the Y values at each point. So from two peaks, we can get higher peaks in the new wave, or we can get a cancellation of the waves for peaks and valleys, which gives us an easy way to construct a new complex wave. And this can also be done for any number of initial sine or cosine waves, allowing us to construct increasingly intricate waveforms. But what if we already have an intricate wave? Is it possible to find its initial waves of constant frequency, basically having a reverse engineering approach? 
There is, and it is called a Fourier transform. The three blue, one brown has a very intuitive and clear explanation as to how you can find these basic waves, both mathematically and geometrically, so you can check it out in the description. But why are we mentioning Fourier transforms for our irradiance light probes? These waves are 1D signals and our probes are 2D, right? Well, what if we take this portion of the sine wave with one node in the middle, the part of the wave that does not oscillate, and wrap it on a circular arc? We can then generate a rotational surface from it that changes based on the amplitude of the wave. We can do the same thing if we have two nodes wrapping the sine wave around a semicircle and creating a revolution surface in the process. Now, this is the concept of spherical harmonics, which are a set of mathematical functions that define smooth, continuous patterns on the surface of a sphere, while only using several important coefficients, which is far more memory efficient than storing all the values of the vertex coordinates or color for that matter. So if Fourier transforms are to deconstruct complex 1D signals, spherical harmonics are there to deconstruct complex 2D signals. The spherical harmonics have varying order and complexity. In order to define this, we use L to annotate the spherical harmonic level, or the number of nodes, and M to annotate what is their orientation. But these are not spheres, but undulating sphere-like surfaces. So are they of any use to us then if we have spherical light probes? Well, to answer that, let's go back to the light probes and Gregor's master thesis on the topic, where he uses the irradiance value at specific samples on a sphere as an amplitude for surface dispositions along the surface normals. By doing so, he generates an irradiance volume, something we can see on the far right, where each sample on the sphere is moved along its normal by a certain irradiance value. So, it seems that on one hand side, we have a clear way to transfer the light probe information to a radial plot or the irradiance volume that looks like a sphere-like surface. And on the other side, we have a way to define a sphere-like surface using memory-efficient spherical harmonics. So, can we connect them? That is the question. Let's take a look at this spherical harmonic with two nodes and no changes in orientation. We can observe the motion of the L2M0 spherical harmonic, but make the surface transparent to see what is happening on the inside. And now since we have a sphere as a light probe, we can place it inside and map the distance of the points on the sphere to the undulating spherical harmonic, which would be the irradiance volume, thus transferring the distance to color. And here we have it, a way to connect our light probe to spherical harmonics. Now, Bear in mind, this is not how we calculate nor use spherical harmonics. This is just a visual representation of these things and how they can be connected. We usually use level two spherical harmonics since they have only nine coefficients to define, which should be sufficient for irradiance probes. But how do we use these spherical harmonics? Actually, we use a formula as is shown here. And even if I tell you what each variable and annotation is here, I guess you would feel just the same as you did looking at the rendering equation for the first time, for example. So are we going to go into greater detail and understand what each part is in, in this formula? No, I was thinking of something better. First, let's rewrite this equation in simpler terms. So the total amount of irradiance E for a surface normal N can be calculated as the sum of the products between each spherical harmonic basis function Y nine of them in this case, and its corresponding coefficient ci. But even this might feel abstract. So let's step down a dimension. Imagine a 1D signal and how we'd represent it using a Fourier transform in a similar way. The value of the function f of x can be calculated as the sum of these products between each basis function phi, nine of them in this case as well, and its corresponding coefficients ai. The structure is exactly the same as in spherical harmonics, just in one dimension. To make things more comprehensive, let's replace the generic basis function with a simple cosine here to make it look hopefully a little more recognizable. And this should feel more familiar. This is the example from the beginning, stacking up waves to get a more complex looking one. But even with formulas, it's still a bit abstract. So let's visualize it with a concrete example. Now let's say that for every x value, which would be the equivalent to the surface normal of our probe, we can compute the y value, which would be equivalent to us calculating the irradiance at that sample point of our probe using path tracing. By going through all the samples we have, we can plot them to generate a smooth curve similar to how diffuse indirect lighting changes across a surface. Now using a Fourier transform, we can extract the nine coefficients that match the basis cosine waves that when combined reproduce our complex curve. Once we have these coefficients, we no longer need the curve. For any x, we can instantly compute the y using the basis functions we know and the coefficients we just calculated. The same logic applies in a higher dimension. We calculate the irradiance for each sample along the normal on the probe 
and generate an irradiance volume, just as Gregor described. Now, this information is then collapsed into a spherical harmonic representation where the lighting is expressed as a combination of the basis functions shaping the color on the probe. Since we know the basis functions and the irradiance value at each sample direction, we compute the spherical harmonics coefficients, typically nine coefficients for a level two harmonic, and store only those. Now, during shading, we take the surface normal of the geometry, convert it into spherical coordinates with the azimuth and polar angles, evaluate the spherical harmonic basis functions at that direction, which are already known, and combine them with the stored coefficients we just calculated, typically through a simple dot product, which is usually faster than a texture lookup. And this gives us the irradiance for that specific normal direction, which we then apply as the indirect diffuse lighting on the geometry. This approach was introduced only a year after the previous paper, so in 2002 by Sloan and colleagues, which was called pre-computed radiance transfer, and that is viewed as the first time that spherical harmonics were used to speed up lighting in a scene. By projecting both light and surface responses into SH space, they could pre-compute how complex lighting interacts with a surface and reduce it to a dot product, so perhaps a bit on how it works. So they take the environment lighting, project it into spherical harmonics, and pre-compute how each part of the surface responds to that lighting, including shadows and interreflections. The magic is that both the lighting and the transfer functions live in the same spherical harmonic space. So that means when you want to render, all you need is a dot product to evaluate the final shading, even with complex global effects. However, it only works for static geometry, but spherical harmonics had a huge potential to be used for illuminating dynamic or moving geometry. So for comparison, a typical 128 by 128 cube map probe with six faces takes about 1.1 megabyte of memory. A nine coefficient spherical harmonics probe, L2, using 32 bit floats for each of the three RGB channels takes only 108 bytes. So over 10,000 times smaller. And that efficiency improves even more when comparing to higher resolution light probes. But can we take it even further? So storing the full RGB spherical harmonics for every light probe typically requires 27 floats. So nine per each RGB color channel. But there's a clever optimization. Since the color of diffused lighting changes slowly, we can separate luminance and chrominance. Luminance is the overall brightness or intensity of light, how bright something is regardless of its color. While chrominance describes the color information the hue and saturation. Since the color of the diffused light changes slowly across space, we only store full detail for luminance using nine spherical harmonics coefficients. For chrominance, we store just an average RGB color or a simplified color direction. And this reduces storage from 27 floats to only 15, with nearly no visible difference, a huge memory saving in real-time rendering. So, so far we've tackled the two biggest technical challenges of light probes, performance and memory. Spherical harmonics help with fast evaluation using dot products and compressing RGB into luminance and chrominance reduces memory usage by over 18,000 times compared to cube maps. But even though we've optimized performance and storage, a bigger problem still remains, accuracy, or more precisely, awareness. So the main problem with SH probes is that they don't understand geometry. They store lighting in world space, but they have no idea what's blocking that light. So one of the problems that can occur are light leaks, where irradiance bleeds through walls during interpolation. Now this happens because SH probes are stored in world space and don't understand the scene's geometry. So when some probes are placed inside a wall and others are outside, the interpolation between them causes irradiance to bleed through, lighting up in closed spaces unrealistically. Another problem is the missing ambient occlusion, because the scene surfaces do not know what's around it to cast soft shadows, making the result less realistic and hence less immersive. Now, one way to fix these issues is to introduce an occlusion factor, which means that for each point being shaded, we check if it can actually see each nearby probe. If it's occluded, that probe's influence is reduced or removed. And this helps fix the light leaks. This also helps with the ambient occlusion or the lack of shadows. So can we introduce this occlusion factor? Ideally, to fix these issues, we could check visibility from our shading point to each of its nearest probes using ray tracing, for example. But at the beginning of the 2000s, there was no practical way to do this form of scene understanding in real time. But we'll check on this story in the next lecture, so be sure to check it out. So it seems we have almost everything working for us regarding the light probes. We've solved memory efficiency with spherical harmonics compressions. We've solved performance with dot products evaluation. So we should be good to go and see how this works with Lumen, right? Well, not just yet. If you remember, all of this works for diffuse lighting only. So 
it's low frequency view independent effects. So what happens when we try to store high frequency lighting? So something with sharp transitions like a shadow edge or a spotlight grazing over complex geometry. If we store that kind of light using low order spherical harmonics, we get something called ringing or the Gibbs phenomenon. And honestly, the name says it all. The result looks like rippling bands or false color gradients around sharp features. So why does it happen? To understand why, let's go back to something simpler, a 1D signal in the form of a square wave, which is a function with a sudden jump, just like geometry going from fully lit to fully shadowed. Now, if we try to approximate that square wave using a few sine waves, the result will always overshoot and undershoot. You'll never quite get clean edges, just softened versions with bumps near the transition. The same thing happens with spherical harmonics. One way to reduce ringing is windowing, a process that fades out the higher frequency SH coefficients, which smooths out the transitions, but also blurs the sharpness of the lighting. And that means we are doing a trade-off, less ringing, but also less sharp details. So while spherical harmonics work great for diffuse low frequency lighting, they're not suited for specular sharp effects. And that means if we want to handle reflections and high frequency content, we need something else. And that's where reflection probes come back in. Now, these probes store radiance, as we've discussed, so not irradiance. They capture directionally dependent light, as seen in glossy reflections, usually by using cube maps with a lot of texels, like 1024 by 1024 per face. So is that it? Can we just try and combine the optimized light probes from before with reflection probes and their high frequency cube maps and finally be done with it? Not quite. Reflection probes have a serious limitation amongst which are that they are manually placed and cannot update dynamically given the large cube map resolution. They also require blending zones to avoid the ugly seams and require parallax correction for nearby objects. So while reflection probes aim to solve view dependent lighting, they struggle with accuracy and flexibility, which made reflections feel disconnected and blurry in dynamic scenes. Now, it looked like there was no way to make both dynamic, diffuse, and glossy reflective surfaces work in real time anytime soon. Uh, not without sacrificing speed, memory, or visual quality, to be exact. And that has not changed since. So, we have no reflection probes in Lumen. But the question is, do we use spherical harmonics in Lumen? The answer is yes, but just barely. Lumen occasionally falls back to world space probes, which we have discussed in our previous lecture on environment probes that you can check out here. And in those cases, it stores only irradiance using spherical harmonics because it's compact and fast to evaluate using the dot product we talked before. But this is just a fallback, just a fraction, and it's definitely not enough to drive a dynamic lighting system. So in order to make Lumen work, like really work, something more drastic was needed. Something that could handle lighting, not just across space, but across view directions. Something that could handle radiance. And the truth is, if we want to support dynamic reflections, glossy highlights, refractions, caustics, and view dependent effects, we need something more. Something that goes beyond irradiance. So the next question was simple. If we could cache irradiance, could we also cache radiance? And that's where the next step begins, which we will explore in the next lecture on radiance caching and how it became the core of Lumen's real-time lighting system. If you found this video useful, consider liking, sharing, and leaving a comment to improve the algorithm. So I thank you for your time and hope to see you in the next video. Bye.